youngest, who's now 11, was diagnosed with lymphoma. Uh, he was actually diagnosed with tyrosinemia, which is uh, metabolic liver disease, so he needed a liver transplant. So he had two, and then the lymphoma was a result of the immunosuppressant, so it was a side effect from his treatment. Um, so he went through that, and he's 11 now, so that was all when he was two and under, um, and he's doing wonderful. When he was little, I was holding him on my lap as he was getting labs drawn, and then he moved to, he would sit in the chair by himself, and about six months ago, he started going back all by himself, so um, it's just a really big change for me. Has anyone talked to you about the transition time as far as moving from pediatric providers to adult providers and how that works? Um, they have not talked to me about that. Uh, it's something that I'm very much aware of. I work with Dr. Brito in the Teen Health Center at Cincinnati Children's, so that's one of the programs that we are actually focusing on is transitioning those kids. Um, I'm not looking forward to it for my own son, but uh, Children's, Cincinnati Children's is great and wonderful, so it's, it'll be a transition for the both of us. So, How did you end up at the conference? Um, Dr. Brito went ahead and I worked for her and she said, hey, there's this conference with technology and working with teens, obviously it's something that we're always thinking about. Uh, so she asked if I'd like to come out, and I said, absolutely. We work together in something we call the Asthma Innovation Lab at Children's, which is really about being the prototypers for new ways to deliver care for kids with chronic disease. And so we've, as you said, we've used lots of different technologies, tried to learn from different companies outside healthcare, and um, so this, was, this is the place where all those folks come. I also work on the C3N, which is the Collaborative Chronic Care Network, again, in designing, so this was the place to be to learn more. My favorite thing, probably listening to Michael Graves this morning, um, you know, talking about really basic stuff about where people spend weeks and months and days that are really important and we can't figure out, you know, how to put the trash can close enough to throw your Kleenex, uh, stuff like that. So I think those seem very simple, but they have made have such huge impact on everybody. It's like, okay, why aren't all hospitals like figuring out how to make their designs for their rooms better right now? The talk by Regina, um, again, kind of being almost similar as far as dealing with the doctors and experiencing that same frustration and understanding what she went through. Um, and she's just a fantastic speaker, so it was just wonderful to listen to her. And are you involved in any of the breakout sessions, or are you sticking mostly to the big conference? I went ahead and I, the breakout session that I attended was about web-based um, technology. Uh, <laughs> again, it was some of it was very uh, provider focused as far as developing technologies for providers. I pushed them a little bit and said, you know, this is a great thing for providers, um, but what about making it interactive so that providers can use it with patients, so that patients can learn about their illness, can see the pathophysiology about their illness, can understand how their medicines affect their illness. Um, and I was told they're working on that. So. And then one other question I had for you is what we talked about before, actually, where you were saying one of the parts that you really liked about the conference was hearing patients' stories and wondering what it was like for people who maybe they didn't have a mom as engaged as you are. So what do you think are the steps, the next steps in, in working with that group of patients and their parents or their loved ones? Um, I think. You know, as some people have pointed out, and even one of the speakers, um, you know, he said, I was in the hospital and I was all alone. Uh, so for them to, you know, use this technology and present it to parents so that they don't feel all alone, um, so that they know that they can reach out, I think is a way to help um, empower the patient, empower the parent, and help to let those parents know you can learn how to self-manage your child's chronic condition. As I say, I think the other thing is that we can do a much better job of going to where folks live because that's where they take care of themselves. And so like our team spent some time like going to kids' houses and they're really quite willing to tell you, you know, both you understand their environment way better when you go spend some time with them. But also they're very willing to tell you all about what's what's hard in their life to do their disease, what would make it easier, you know. So I think really 
designing with kids, together with kids, even then they're very disenfranchised kids, they have great ideas and you can you can design stuff that works for them. It doesn't just work if you happen to have lots of great advantages. So. What do you think prevents doctors and healthcare providers from doing more of that and going to meet people where they're at? Um, well, I think there's a bunch of, there's stuff, we're not really trained, how do you do that? You know, like how do you really learn from the IDOs and the Intuits and all those folks about how you do that? Um, we don't get paid to do it. Right? You get paid, people have talked about you get paid for visits, which is crazy, right? Because visits this one little tiny thing, and it's really about how do you take care of your life all the time. And so if we could change, and that's just a U.S. craziness thing, right? If you went to Sweden or somewhere else, they would say, here's our system, and we'll make a system work, but we don't have that. So I think that's, that's a big problem.